you know, the diversity uh, agenda, so-called, always amuses me in, 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 in regard to the, to the BBC because, okay, I'd like to see diversity at the BBC. I really would. I think it would be a huge advance if we had proper diversity at the BBC. Some political diversity, for instance, and maybe some diversity um, from the current uh, monoculture of social liberalism and a few social conservatives. That would be a kind of diversity, would it not? Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kisson. And this is a show for you if you're bored with people arguing on the internet over subjects they know nothing about. At Trigonometry, we don't pretend to be the experts, we ask the experts. Our brilliant guest this week is a former BBC journalist and executive, Robin Aiken. Welcome to Trigonometry. Well, thank you very much. Well, uh, for anyone who doesn't know you, we'll get into the couple of books that you've written about bias at the BBC. Tell us a little bit about how are you in this chair today? What's been your journey through life? And how have you come to you know, be talking about the issues we'll be talking about today? Um, yes, well, uh, I'm a journalist and have been for 40 years and more. Um, so uh, my kind of journey through journalism, if you like, um, was... Uh, bit of a march back in time. In the days that I started, I started out on a local newspaper. In fact, my pre-story was that I was a medical student. Um, and so I started out at medical school and um, I was lazy and feckless. <laughs> 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 and uh, the dean of the medical school had me in and said, uh, Mr. Aitken, you have been outstandingly idle and uh, we can do without you. So I left and I became a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> There's only really two options from that point, journalist to become a comedian. Uh, or a teacher. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> I discovered actually that, uh, that idleness is not, a, not an advantage in journalism. In fact, you know, it's a hard working profession when you get into it. But I started, um, because of this rather rocky start, I, I started at the bottom on a local newspaper in Walsall in the West Midlands, the black country. Although I come from Somerset, I was brought up in Somerset. And um, so that was a real education for me because the black country is a real working class area. And I had been brought up in Bath and in Somerset um, in a middle class environment. So I learned an awful lot through that. By various stages, I made my way, first of all, to local radio for the BBC. And then I was appointed to a, a reporting job in Scotland. And I was the economics and business correspondent for BBC Scotland for, for, for some years in the middle of the 1980s. Um, after that, I moved down to London. I came down to work for um, BBC News. So um, I was working on the main news outlets, what we used to call the fireman's service. So you were sort of sitting there uh, on the taxi rank and whatever came up, you went and did. It involved a fair bit of travel and you got to do, um, you know, everything from air crashes to... Um, uh, I can't think of a suitable... Uh, a Opening suitable. a supermarket. <laughs> 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 BBC wasn't really into that in those days. But, you know, I did yes, everything, yeah, and, a, everything yeah. and anything. And um, then I went to the money program, um, and I worked there for a few years, um, and then a, a program called um, On the Record, which is a politics program. And uh, then I did a bit of news again, and eventually I was hired by um, the Today program, and uh, Rod Little was the editor in those days, and um, he hoiked me out of obscurity, put me on the Today program, and those were my best years as a reporter, really. It's a strange dystopian, kind of unrecognizable world that you describe where Rod Little could be on the Today program. I don't imagine that happening today, which I suppose is the subject that we're really talking about. So uh, you're a conservative, as I understand yeah. it, and you've worked your way through the BBC, yes. and your books are essentially your reflections on being a conservative at the BBC. Yes. What is that like? Okay, well, let me just explain something to you, Constantine. I, mean, I, I am a conservative, that is true. Um, and I'm, I'm a conservative, a social conservative, I would say. Well, and I make the distinction because I think that social conservative values are the, one that, are the ones that matter most to me. And they are the ones which are most neglected and most discriminated against by the BBC. I also happen to be, and have been in the past, a supporter of the Conservative Party itself. Um, uh, so I'm a conservative in both 
in both senses, in, 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 in those terms. But what matters most to me is social conservatism. What was it like at being at the BBC? It was like being the only black guy in a crowd of white men. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I was at the BBC, I've always been interested in politics, and I always used to quiz my colleagues about their political affiliations. And um, it became very clear to me from a, an early stage in my BBC career that I was surrounded by um, left-wingers, really, I I in short. A lot of people were, were liberal Democrats, or they, were sort of, they thought of themselves as centrists, but essentially they were on the left, or slightly on the left, sort of center-left. Um, it became particularly apparent during the Thatcher years, because Thatcher was such a divisive figure. Um, I had, as I said, I worked as an economics correspondent, and it became clear to me that the, in purely economic terms, the way we were running the country in the 1970s, where we had large, hugely loss-making nationalized industries, this was a foolish way to run our economy, because what we ended up doing was putting a lot of money into industries which were increasingly uncompetitive. And um, if you um, take Adam Smith, the great economist, and his wealth of nations, the idea that the simple idea boils down to this, that there's something called competitive advantage. So uh, Iceland um, has a competitive advantage in producing fish. Mm. Um, Germany does not. Why is that? Well. Iceland's in the middle of the ocean, it has lots of trawler men. <laughs> Germany's in the middle of Europe and doesn't. Um, so you let, you, let, you let Iceland produce the fish, Germany produced the cars, right? Um, in our case, in Britain, we were very good at some things and still are very good at some things. For instance, we're very good at many of the service industries like um, architecture, um, uh, marketing, um, advertising, banking, these big service industries. We're excellent at those. In fact, we're world beaters at those. We're not so good, as it happens, at um, making steel. And there are reasons for that, built-in reasons why we're not particularly competitive when it comes to steel making. Thatcher realized that, and her whole economic thrust was to move money away from these loss-making industries, free them up, sell them off, see how they could do in the free market, and allow the wealth of our nation to be put into more productive, uh, end, to more productive ends. But the consequence of that, a social consequence of that, was hugely disruptive and very divisive. People lost their jobs. It was absolutely awful for many people. And the human pain and misery which resulted from that shouldn't be underestimated. But I took the view that um, this was a necessary form of shock treatment to get the country's economy back on track. Within the BBC, you could count on one hand the number of people who thought like that. I found myself in the position often of, of, of working on programs where they were quite explicitly hostile to, to Thatcher. Um, and this hostility was an ideological hostility to what Thatcher herself was doing, although she won three um, big election victories and was obviously popular. People understood in the country what she was doing. The BBC almost became the official opposition during that time. So I found myself as a conservative in the BBC, somebody who was um, uh, politically friendless, although I have many friends and at the BBC. You know, they're great people to work with. You know, they're, um, they're people like, you know, they're well-educated, they're decent, polite people. But they overwhelmingly come from um, liberal social backgrounds, and they overwhelmingly incline to the left. Now, I suppose a counter argument to that is this: Whenever I look at, you know, there's a Labour forum on Facebook. Great people. <laughs> Not if you're Jewish. <laughs> no, if you're Jewish, yeah, I know. But you know, you, you've had a good run. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, all I see from the Labour forums are Brexit Broadcasting Corporation. Why is Farage on there all the time? You know, the BBC is right wing. It's a cabal. Is it not the fact that, as the BBC, you know, they've got to put on left and right, they're going to take a pummeling from both sides? Um, 
Well, funny enough, actually, what you say, Francis, is, is exactly the BBC, the argument, the argument the BBC itself uses to justify its own, um, its own stance. It says, well, look, we're criticised from both sides, therefore we must be right. However, um, I don't know if, if either of you saw, did either of you see the interview between um, a chap called Ben Shapiro and Andrew Yes, Neal? Yes, we yes. did, yeah. Yeah, right, okay. So um, I thought that was a very telling interview, and the reason I thought it was telling was, was this, that Andrew Neal is um, the BBC's in-house right-winger. He's widely recognised. I think you'd agree, wouldn't you, mm. that you know, people see him as a very right-wing personality, yes. right? But um, that interview went off the rails because um, Andrew Neil started a, uh, a line of questioning about the abortion debate in the US. Mm. And he said, he used the, fr- the, the words he used was, he said, he said yes, but the, you know, some of the laws being introduced in some of the states are taking us back to the dark ages. These are barbaric mm. laws. And he was talking about restrictive abortion laws mm. in the US. And Shapiro who is, of course, a right-winger in American terms, is a social conservative. And he immediately bridled that. He said, he said to to Andrew Neil, he said, are you a comment journalist or are you an objective journalist? The point being that he was, the point he was making was that Andrew Neil had included in the question a very loaded comment. That was that these laws which were trying to restrict abortion were taking us back to the dark ages. What that showed to me was this, that the BBC's most notable, most clearly right-wing journalist is actually a social liberal. When it comes down to it, uh, he's on the side of the social liberal argument. The social liberal argument which says that uh, we uh, we, we are liberal about issues like abortion, divorce, euthanasia, Uh, sexual moral conduct in general. We don't care what you do in your bedrooms. You can do whatever you want in your bedrooms. Um, uh, That's no concern of ours. We approve of it. You can worship whoever you like. We don't care about that. We don't think it matters. Um, This is the social liberal position. This is actually what one of your previous uh, guests on this show, uh, Sir John Curtis, is exactly what he was saying, which is that the dividing line now in the Brexit debate is between, not between left and right, Mm. it's between social conservatives and social liberals. And the point I'm trying to make to you is that, yes, uh, the BBC gets criticized from the left, but underlying it, the BBC's stance is solidly socially liberal. In fact, it has no, as far as I know, and believe me, I, 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 I keep a close eye on it, There are no what I would call social conservative voices on the BBC. And in fact, they don't invite on for interview social conservatives. So the things which concern me as a social conservative um, are not subjects for debate on the BBC. Let me give you an example. You tell me, Francis, that you were a teacher in an East End school, a deprived East End London school, right? And you recounted an anecdote about a child who um, came from a troubled background. One of the biggest problems um, facing the country, I think, in a social sense, is the breakdown of family life. And um, the state can do many things, but it cannot act as a substitute for proper parents. If you're a boy and you're brought up without a father, the consequences of that can be dramatically bad because you have no proper role model. You might have a mum who loves you, and I'm not knocking single mums, some of whom I know do a fantastic job, a self-denying job to raise their kids. But if you don't have a stable male figure um, with the mum over a long period of time, you have bad consequences. Now, that debate, which I think is, is underpins so many of the other debates, which are picked up endlessly by the BBC. For instance, how many times have you heard on the BBC people agonizing about the crisis in mental health amongst young people? The crisis in mental health among young people is inseparable from 
the breakdown of family life. Mm. Because mental disorders in young people are very often the result, not always, but very often the result of family breakdown. We've had people on to talk uh, about this on this show, so we're doing the job the BBC is not doing. But to come back to your point about... Uh, well, getting hate from left-wingers. <laughs> <laughs> we get hate from right-wingers too. Yeah. Every, time we, every time we talk to anybody about anything to do with Tommy Robinson, we just get this massive wall of hate of how we are cucks and libtards. The, I can see They're it. They're happening now. Yeah, the right yeah, now is right. you're watching, the, 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 Tommy Robinson. Mm. That's what's happening. So we get a lot of that. But my point to you about Andrew Neil. A counterpoint might be, I personally agree with you. I think the BBC seems to me as a socially liberally dominated institution. But Andrew Neil has eviscerated people like Owen Jones and Monroe Bergdorf and Ken Livingston. Ken Livingston beautifully. Right. So you could argue that the reason that he was putting that point to Ben Shapiro isn't that that is his point of view, is that the style of interview that Andrew Neil does is to put the opposite side of the point of view that he's challenging in as strong and sometimes emotive terms as possible in order to, I mean, let's be honest, create clickbait. Sure. And um, you make a very good point that Neil is a hostile interviewer mm. and a very good interviewer. Yes. I mean, I would say he's probably the most effective. He's the, the most effective, uh, effective interrogator the BBC has on the front line. However, um, the reason that interview, the one with Shapiro, uh, you know, we're talking about it now because it made it, it was a bit of pickup in the press because it was seen as a bit of a car crash. Car crash interviews reveal something usually not about the interviewee, but about the interviewer. Mm. You think of Kathy Newman and yes. Peter Jordan. Yeah, was, that's exactly yeah, where yeah, my head Jordan went the moment Peter, you said right, that. Yeah. Right, okay. So... There you had, um, so the point of these interviews, supposedly, is to, is to put the interviewee on the spot. Mm. If the interviewer shows their cards and becomes, instead of being the interrogator, becomes a protagonist in the debate, lets their own opinions, as it were, um, go up against those of the interviewee, not in the formula of some people would say, or, you know, some people might think, but as Andrew Neil, now in that interview, he didn't preface his remarks mm. with some people might think. He actually said, but these, he said, but these laws are taking us back to the dark ages. That's worth his words, right? It was quite clear after, I mean, no one, after that interview, I thought, well, I didn't learn a lot about George, I didn't learn very much about Ben Shapiro's views, or <laughs> nothing I couldn't have guessed. <laughs> I learned something about Andrew Neil's views. Mm. I actually tweeted a, a, about this that I thought um, they both came out of it badly in a way. I, I, and the, the, actually, I say they both, we all came out of it badly because you watched an interview with somebody for 16 minutes and you learned nothing about them. If you hadn't known who Ben Shapiro was before then, you've learned almost nothing about what are their point of views, why is he so incredibly popular in America, what is it that he's saying, what is his view on Donald Trump, which is quite nuanced and, and not pro, just massively pro-Trump. So you, you spend 60 minutes of your life yeah. listening to something yes. that tells you nothing about the person to whom you just listened. It, uh, see, the, for me, the difference between the Kathy Newman interview and the Andrew Neil is I think it actually did show something about Shapiro. And I think it was an inability to cope under pressure. Yeah. And the moment we had a, a direct question, because Shapiro likes to portray himself as someone who goes up against students and essentially truth bullets and all the rest of it. But when he came up as somebody who was at the similar level, yeah. I don't think he could cope under pressure. That was the impression that I got from it. Well, I, I'd agree with that, actually. And I, 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 in fact, I... I, I I agree with both of you. I think they were both losers in a sense. Mm. Um, I, I, and I, I do think that Shapiro to me came across as a very brittle, rather thin-skinned individual. And he couldn't cope with Andrew Neil's gravitas. I mean, you know, Neil's he is a really serious journalist. You know, he has held all these positions. You know, he's been the editor of the Sunday Times and Times. You know, he, he heads up the, he, he, what I'm saying is he is a seasoned journalist. He's bloody that? good at what he does. He's bloody good at what he does. You really want to and, show him. And, and, <laughs> and, and really, <laughs> to me, Shapiro looked, um, 
a, a lightweight sort of he looked young and almost scared really mm. and, and he didn't handle it at all well and um but also i didn't i, I didn't I would like to have known what it was about Shapiro that, as you say, made him, why is he popular? Yeah. Why does anybody, yes. you know, sure. why, why was Andrew Neil bothering to interview um, this guy exactly. Shapiro? Um, because he's got this huge following in the States. Why? What is it that he's saying? We never got to that point because no, exactly. we got sidetracked into all this kind of, into this battle between the two of them. Which but also, I, I would say to Francis as well, Ben Shapiro, I think, came out of it badly because he didn't know who Andrew Neil was and he was unprepared. Uh, you go, uh, the, the reason Ben Shapiro is as big as he is, is you go and watch him being interviewed by Piers Morgan while Piers Morgan was doing his American show. Mm on gun control, which is a very difficult issue. And he, he, he comes across as very, very calm and measured, but also very strong. So it, it, it's an issue where everybody did badly, I feel. Yeah, and we yeah. all came out of it very badly. I mean, I think a more prescient interview, and I know this will go out when this goes out, you know, the European elections will be done and dusted. But Andrew Marr's interview of Farage, I thought was a disgrace. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not pro-Brexit. And I was watching this going, why are you not addressing about Brexit? Why are you talking about events that Absolutely. happened five, ten, whatever years ago? I could not agree with you more. I thought, uh, in, in, I tell you, okay, a lot of people don't know the mechanism of, of these things. I do. And I know what happens, right? You've got a big political interview on a show like The Mar Show. Um, that is thoroughly prepared for. So uh, the production team, you know, first of all, they land their man midweek and then they have a few days and there's some usually bright young junior producer who, um, who, who puts together a brief and the brief is presented to, uh, to, to Ma so he knows everything that he might care to know, you know, often with little embarrassing quotes or little gaffes that the guy has made. And then... Um, the Mar and the editor, senior producer types would sit around they'd, and they'd, they'd try to plan an interview, right? So this is, this is how we're going to play it. We're going to start on this and then at this point, you know, we'll, use, we'll start quizzing him about these things which are supposedly embarrassing. Now, um, I think that was the wrong game plan because we're not electing a prime minister. Now. You know, we're not electing a prime minister in these Euro elections. However well Farage does, he's not going to be walking in the the gates of number 10. By the time know. this interview comes out, you never know. Maybe, maybe he will be. <laughs> he may well be already there, Robert. But you know, you know I mean, yeah. you know, basically, the thing is, so, so all this stuff that Ma threw at, threw at uh, Farage, you know, um, did he say this about the NHS? Did he, what about the poster? These were irrelevant issues, as Farage rightly pointed out. As Farage kept trying to bring the thing back on track and saying, but you know, um, you're ignoring what the issue is here. And I do think that Farage um, is right when he made the issue of democratic accountability the central thing he wanted to talk about because that is certainly one of the big issues or the big issue really in, in these elections which are now a few days away from us, but by the time you see this, we'll be done and dusted. Uh, and I suspect we know how that's, that's going to turn out. Guys, we wanted to take a moment to say thank you to every single one of you that has supported us on Patreon, Subscribestar, that sent us money through PayPal. We could not do the show without you. Please keep supporting us. And if you haven't already, please consider doing so because that is exactly what allows us to keep improving the show every single week. Having said that, we've now also got a corporate sponsor to sell out to. Indeed we have, and it is the magazine The Week. And what The Week does is it pulls together the best articles from over 200 different sources, from publications such as The Times, The Telegraph, or for our one liberal snowflake fan, The Guardian. They do exactly what we do on the show, which is pull together balanced opinions from different sides so that you can make your own mind up and you don't get stuck in an echo chamber. And if you want to take advantage of this special offer, all you need to do is go to theweek.co.uk slash offer, use our special code TRIGGER and you'll get six free issues of the week. The great thing about the week is that it allows you to read less and know more, which is going to appeal to people like Francis who can barely read. And it's not just news. The week also brings you the latest from the world of sports. So if you want to find out what's going on in the transfer window, who Manchester United are going to sign, 
the week will also deliver you the latest, freshest news on that, which won't appeal to someone like Constantine because he's a massive virgin. <laughs> massive? I've been married 15 years. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, it's grown back, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, guys, well, seriously, we know that you've got busy lives. We understand that you're not going to be reading 200 articles a week. And that's what the magazine does. It brings together those articles in the one combined easy package that you can read and know what's going on. Join thousands that trust The Week as their essential curated news source. Try it for yourself and get your first six issues completely free. To take advantage of this great offer, visit theweek.co.uk forward slash offer, enter our code, which is of course Trigger, and get your first six issues completely free. But on the BBC just carrying on, one of the things Francis and I were just, we were talking on the phone before this interview and just talking about what's happened to the BBC in general beyond the bias issue that you talk about. I, I, I remember watching Question Time religiously. I remember watching the Andrew Marr show religiously. I obviously am interested in politics. I've been in the audience of Question Time. That's how interested I was in it. Um, and... I watched Question Time probably for the first time in a year, a couple of weeks back when Nigel Farage was on it. And they were talking endlessly about Brexit, which is an important issue. And the only conclusion I came away with is that we must leave Question Time with no deal. <laughs> <laughs> because good. because it, it's just, I, yeah. it's unwatchable. Yeah, I know, I couldn't agree it's, more. <laughs> and it's not because it's Farage or someone else. Every time I've tried to watch it in the last year, I maybe watch a five minute clip. Yeah. I just can't watch it. No. It's unwatchable. So what is happening to a, an institution that I personally think is very important yeah. in British public life? Well, you would get many BBC people who would say and would acknowledge the fact that uh, Question Time you know, has been and still is in some people's eyes, one of the most important political programs of the week. So what's happened to it? Well, um, it has become trivialized in, in a certain way, I think. Um, I've stopped watching it, actually, because I, I find, like you, there is something about it which um, no longer does what it says on the tin. So what you want from a program, or what I want from a program like that, is to see serious... I want to see the questions which are in the mind of the public put to serious people in politics and hear what their responses are. And I think that as a format is a very respectable, honorable, in fact, vital thing to do in a way. But somehow, um, Question Time seems to have lost the ability to do that properly. I'm not quite sure why, actually. Um, maybe it's to do with, I know that they have their, you know, that if you, I, I know that, um, I know someone actually who, who, who has worked on Question Time as a, no longer does, but um, she was telling me that how difficult it is for them to um, uh, balance the panel, right? You know, it's very difficult at a time when politics seems to be fragmenting to get every point of view. Mm. Uh, so that's one problem. But also, I think sometimes, you know, I was talking to someone else on a slightly different issue, but um, I was talking to someone, a friend recently, and uh, we were talking about, and I was saying, you know, something that's happened in my lifetime is that um, 30, 40 years ago, no one gave a tinker's about what actors thought mm. <laughs> about politics, right? Um, actors had their place, and they might be very engaging and good at what they do, but no one gave a fuck about what they thought. <laughs> <laughs> Same with comedians. Yeah. 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 Because, because um, you know, actors spend their whole time pretending to be somebody else. Um, what credentials are those? You know, what, what is it about being an actor that qualifies you to appear on question time, to ask a question, to answer questions about Brexit? Mm. Well, frankly, the answer to that is absolutely nothing. Um, but over the, period, over the course of the last 30 years, with the sort of rise of the celebrity culture, um, 
the, we've all been sucked into that, and somehow, suddenly, you know, what Hollywood thinks matters. Um, I think that's one of the problems with 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 Question Time. So the 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 personnel, if you like, has been somewhat watered down, downgraded in a way. They're no longer um, they're no longer quite serious people that they should be. But see, this is where I agree with you in theory, but I think in practice it's actually quite often the other way around. Uh, our good friend Jeff Norcott, who we've had on the show, who's a comedian. Every time he goes on there, he seems to be the, the lone voice of reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and so what I'm talking about isn't so much that they've watered down the intellectual talent or whatever. It's just that it's it's a they're just bickering. Yeah. But, well, that's so so. Well, that's a very interesting observation. So, what does that really? If they're just bickering, uh, and that's very good. That's a, actually a very good description of what you do see. So that would tell you, wouldn't it, that they're not arguing about substantial issues. Mm. What they're doing is they're squabbling over their own, their own little position. They're fighting their own little corner. But actually, in a way, all the politicians are in somehow, they have more in common with each other than they do with the rest of us. That actually, you know, the, the political class, as it were. Uh, and it's be, I think this is becoming clearer and clearer, actually because of the rather harsh light that the Brexit debate has shone on our politics, it's becoming clearer and clearer that, 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 um, that our politicians are, and our, the ruling class, the media class, so you know, the, the politicians, uh, the, to, the, the senior journalists, the senior um, academics, um, senior civil servants, they're united. They all share the same view. They're almost a man, uh, anti-Brexit. I mean, you wouldn't have the problem we've had with Brexit were it not for the very simple fact that in the House of Commons, you've got nearly 80% of MPs who are personally opposed to Brexit. They voted to remain. That's one factor. In the House of Lords, it's probably 95%. So what you've got is you've got a ruling class of politicians who are sitting there on top of the pile running the mechanism which is supposed to get us out, but they all want to stay in. So it's no great surprise that, you know, we've ended up in the muddle we have. And I think maybe that's what's maybe that's what's on show in, in, in question time now. They you know, they're uh, it's kind of politicians against the people somehow. Do you think the BBC is engaged in a race to the bottom because of social media, because everybody wants to see a two-minute clip where so-and-so gets an inverted commas destroyed or whatever else, so they feel that need to buy into it, hence the bickering, hence the talking over one and each other, hence, you know, the lack of listening? Before um, you answer, if you could just destroy Francis for us, <laughs> that, that, that would be brilliant. Yeah, I don't need to, mate. I destroy <laughs> myself on a regular basis. <laughs> no, no. I, uh, um, what do I think about that? I think... Uh, well, I think that the, there is an ineluctable pressure to go down market in certain respects. So the BBC is, although it's publicly funded, of course it feels pressure from commercial rivals. And so inevitably, it has to compete in the same market, right? Um, in a way, it has, it hasn't gone um, quite as low as some of the other outlets. For instance, I don't know, have you ever watched Naked Attraction? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I, I bet you do. Yeah. So it's a great program. <laughs> I hadn't. Sure I mean, okay. So, so, so I hadn't seen it. But when I was writing, when I was researching the book, I was thinking about, um, you know, the way in which, for instance, now. Uh, we can access pornography, mm. right? Uh, at the press of a button, you can see anything you want. Really? You don't have to pretend. Yeah. Even I'm sorry. my wife doesn't watch <laughs> <like> trigonometry. <laughs> I'm sorry to have shocked you. Shocked yeah. you. I mean, yeah. I, this must be I, I'm a moral conservative. <laughs> <laughs> You've led a sheltered life. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, I um, for the first time, I, 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 I'd heard about Naked Attraction. I watched it. And, you know, for anyone who hasn't watched it, basically, it's a, it's a genital beauty, beauty parade, right? So you, you, people... They, they, uh, 
They stand there, they haul their bricks down, and uh, you get a look at either Willie or Fanny, and, oh, this one I like, this one I don't, oh, this one's a bit sort of tattooed, oh, this one's a bit droopy. Well, this um, happens on the BBC. It, this <laughs> happens on, now, this is Channel 4. Oh, right? okay. Can this I just is... say, can I just interrupt? I never thought this interview would go this way. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and, uh, what I, the point I'm making is that this, I mean, you know, can main, that can we go lower than that? I mean, the point is, if that is, you know, that is trash culture, yep. yes. right? That's what I mean, you know, like. <laughs> we, 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 like, okay, we're all guys here in the room. We're all smirking, right? It's, you know, and it's, you know, wow, you know, Fanny is on the TV. That's great, you know, but actually, you know, when you think about it, um, to be a man, to be, to stand up and be a man and not to be led by your dick your whole life, to exercise some self-restraint as best you can is a lesson that every man needs to learn and put into action. If you pander constantly to the sexual urge in males, um, A, it's almost irresistible for young males and for old males too. I mean, look, you know, I mean, I mean I'm not dead yet, but, you know, it's the sex drive is immensely powerful and it can be exploited uh, for commercial reasons, which is what pornography does. In my view, pornography exploits both women, sometimes, not always, but certainly men, because um, males are, have this biological imperative. We're fascinated by the subject. We can't resist images of um, the other sex and the sex act itself. And um, these things just are immensely powerful drivers of male behavior. And if you allow that unrestricted access to that, um, you do damage. Because I do think, actually, that, um, I mean, I, I, naked attraction is an example of a sort of creeping pornification of television. And it's on mainstream. It's, it's, it's in its third or fourth series now. Um, so, and, and, you know, and actually, funnily enough, you know, when it first came on, there were some complaints to Ofcom, the regulator, right? So yeah. people said, you know, this is an indecent show. Ofcom had a look at it and they said, well, actually, we don't think it's indecent because basically what this is doing, it's just a variant on a dating show. And, and because there's no actual sexual contact, it's fine. Well, um, forgive me, but I think that is a really feeble and a pathetic response from Ofcom. Because, but then Ofcom is entirely staffed by social liberals who presumably see nothing at all wrong with a show like that. Whereas I think, actually, that it's debasing and degrading. It degrades the culture. It degrades the individuals who are involved in it. It degrades the audience for watching it. And um, I think we'd be a better, happier, healthier country without that kind of crap. Now, what you've talked about with social liberals, do you not think... The, the problem and the challenges that a lot of these broadcasters face is that certain types of people are attracted to certain professions. For example, bankers, you're due, you're naturally they're going to be more materialistic. They're going to be, you know, less, you could argue, less socially conscious. They're going to be more driven. Because more prone to cocaine. More prone to cocaine. <laughs> Absolutely. All these, all these things. I mean, they're stereotypes, but there's a reason that they exist. Yes. And do you not think that socially liberal people are more attracted to being journalists? Because a lot of people, when they go into journalism, they, they have this fantasy, you know, that they're going to be the one bringing down, you know, this evil corporation with a big scoop and yeah. all the rest of it. How do you bring a corporation down oh, with but, a but, scoop? But, but, yeah, well, <laughs> well, well, look, well look, look what's happened to the news of the world. Yeah. That, that got brought to its knees. Sorry, it was just a terrible pun. Yeah. All oh, right. Um... Oh, well, yeah, I just, oh, don't yeah. ever do that again. I'm yeah. going to look for a new presenter. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> right. A number of interesting points. One is you're absolutely right that uh, journalists play up to the mental image of the journalist as hero. Um, so, you know, there's this long standing tradition of uh, movies and television programs and books where the journalist is the hero character, right? You know, he's the, uh, he's the seeker after truth who brings down the big corporation or whatever it is. So journalists are very attracted to that as an idea. But um, the, the other point that you make about 
isn't it the case that um, bankers uh, naturally, you know, that, that, that a mercenary instinct um, is the sort of selector, is the, is the reason why people might go into banking and they might not go into journalism. But my point is slightly different, which is that probably you would find, in fact, you would certainly find that the upper reaches of the banking profession is just as socially liberal as, is, as are the upper echelons of the journalistic profession. Um, there was a, a sociologist by the name of uh, Peter Berger, and he was very prominent in the 1960s in, in, in America. Uh, and he, 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 he wrote a very influential book um, about secularization theory. And um, what he predicted was, he said that, um, that by the 21st century, so he was writing in 1968, I think, or thereabouts, he wrote a very um, a prominent piece in the New York Times. And it said that uh, by, by the 21st century, religious believers would be restricted to isolated pockets, um, beleaguered in a sea of secular of a secular world. And he, he saw this as the future of the world. This is 1968, right? So in the, in the succeeding 40 years, you had what? You had the Iranian Revolution and the Ayatollahs kicking out the Shah. You had the fall of the Soviet Union, precipitated, let us remember, by a sort of, uh, by a Roman Catholic subversive resistance in Poland, which was the thing which sparked the whole thing off. You've had the rise of Islamic State. You've had all these phenomena, phenomena, and you've had actually the reconversion of Russia back into a, a much more religious state than it used to be. So far from being, far from fulfilling Berger's prediction that the world would become secularized, in fact, religion has not gone away. And in some ways, religion has become more prominent in our world today than it was back in the 1960s. But now, Berger is very, very interesting and very intelligent. Um, uh, uh, you know, he's someone well worth reading, actually. But uh, he, so he had a long life, and in the, um, in the uh, about 10 years ago, he thoroughly recanted secularization theory. He said, I got it wrong. His new take is this. He says that secularization theory is, um, is, is carried by a very select elite group of Western people, Western type people. They have some things in common. They are all very well educated. Um, they all come from well educated backgrounds. And they occupy senior positions in all those professions and occupations which mold our current reality. So in the law, in government, in the media, You've got people who basically subscribe to secularization theory. They are themselves secular. They're not believers. They are atheistic and materialistic and secular. And, but because of their influential position, because they sit in these very influential jobs, they, of course, have a massively disproportionate influence on the way the rest of us think. Um, I've slightly lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about, but we were talking about why you know journalists, uh, uh, ju oh, socially yes, liberal yeah, yeah. people, yeah. attracted to, yeah. to, to journalism. So, so what I what, so, so what I'm saying is that the is that is that basically, it's the same sort of people you would find. Uh, you would find very similar attitudes at the in the boardroom of Goldman Sachs as you would in the boardroom at the BBC, or in the boardroom at Channel 4, or in the newsroom at Channel 4. But I guess Francis' point is that uh, when we talk about the BBC being biased, yeah. that's not because evil BBC directors are hiring only people that they agree with. It's because what he's saying, I think, is that it naturally attracts a certain type of person, and therefore you get this naturally created, naturally occurring bias, if you like, right? Um, yeah, I think there is certainly, I mean, o o there is obviously truth in that because, um, you know, you don't become a journalist unless you like writing, you know, mm -hmm. it's all, it's all, you've got to be able to write and you've got to be able to think straight and you've got to be able, you've got to have an intellectual curiosity about the world. 
I mean, I, I'd say about, you know, in my own experience, um, I went to some fascinating places, did some fascinating jobs, but what ended up fascinating me most was the organization I was working for. Mm. Um, and I found it highly resistant to the idea of any critical analysis. The BBC's capability when it comes to self-examination are not great. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and so, um, but of course, so, so, so yes, I mean, in, in one sense, of course you're right. And, and no one who is enumerate goes into banking, I suspect. And no one who is illiterate goes into journalism. So in that sense, you're absolutely right. But what, the point I'm making there is that, in fact, um, the, the elite in Western societies all share, by and large, the same outlook on life. I was, we were at a conference uh, last week, and I was talking to a particularly notable academic from one of the best universities, not, not only in the UK, in the world, and he was saying that he cancelled his BBC subscription, which first of all blew my mind that you know, somebody would do it, and I said, why? And he said, I don't like the way the BBC reports on certain, sub on certain topics, in particular the Gilets Jaunes, and he used that as an example, and he said that the BBC were ignoring that because it did not fit with their political outlook. Would you agree with that? 100%, 100%. You know, I, I think it's deeply ironic that the BBC keeps reporting on this idea of fake news, right? Mm. So the BBC has made, I mean, the BBC has made it absolutely plain that it hates everything to do with Donald Trump can't stand the man, can't stand his platform. And it, it, and this shows through in everything it reports about him. Now, the BBC um, picked up on this phrase which originated with Trump, or at least he made it, he made it, he popularized this phrase of fake news. And he said, you know, the, the, the mainstream media in the US um, was full of fake news. Now, what did he mean by that? You see, I think that this is the critical distinction which people miss. Things can be accurate, news can be accurate, but still unfair. So if I only relay accurate but negative information about you on my news program, I'm being accurate. And, and fair. It, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, yeah, but I'm not. You're just but being I'm not. like my mum. That's, that's all you're doing. Then. So, it's, but you're not being fair. Mm. You know what? Mm. So, so I was uh, I was raised a, a Catholic, and the uh, the good nuns who raised me um, used to teach me about the difference between calumny and detraction. Right. Mm. So, calumny is when you tell a lie about somebody. Detraction, on the other hand, is when you tell a truth about somebody, but a truth which ought not to be told. Mm. So maybe private information, which is greatly to their disadvantage. The BBC is a great detractor of Trump. Mm. It, doesn't, it doesn't lie about him. What it does is it only tells the negative side of the story. The gilets jaunes are the flip side of that coin. I mean, the gilets jaunes are the French version of that. The gilets jaunes, as I understand it, um, I have only had minimal contact with them. Uh, personally, and that was at a roadblock in uh, northern France. I found them absolutely charming. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had someone on to talk about yeah. uh, to talk about them, but I, I, this is France. You and I were discussing yeah. this, weren't we? Yeah. The fact that what when I look at the BBC News website, which is still the place that I go to yeah. for, to see some of the news, what I notice is not. The, I don't feel that the stories are inaccurate. It's just they're clearly selected to exactly. present a very particular view. Exactly. And nowhere is, is that more true, in my opinion, than the diversity agenda. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to ask you about is that the BBC now has policies in place to um, increase the representation of certain minority yes. groups. They have this, they, I, I saw an article the other day that uh, the BBC want to make sure that one out of seven uh, headline TV presenters is gay or lesbian, which made me wonder why they want to reduce the number of gay people on TV, <laughs> to be honest, right? So th they, they've got this ad agenda, it seems yeah. like to me, in hiring, there's uh, positive discrimination uh, in favor of certain ethnic minorities. 
And that seems to me now in the world that we live in to be part of a particular mindset. Mm. That isn't just something that people do just mm. because. That seems to be a reflection of a particular view. Do you think those things are connected? I do. And, uh, you know, the diversity uh, agenda, so-called, always amuses me in, 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 res in, in regard of the, to the BBC because, okay, I'd like to see diversity at the BBC. I really would. I think it would be a huge advance if we had proper diversity at the BBC, some political diversity, for instance, and maybe some diversity um, from the current uh, monoculture of social liberalism and a few social conservatives. That would be a kind of diversity, would it not? I mean, the fact is that simply having a color chart, you know, color code chart, and making sure you've got every, you know, uh, the right proportion of everyone from, um, from black to albino and everything in between, um, guarantees nothing about the fairness of the, out, uh, of the output. All it means is that you have window dressed the screen um, in some way which is thought to reflect modern Britain without doing anything to seriously consider the content of what you're broadcasting, which is surely the important thing. You know, there is no diversity in the BBC in that, in, in that sense. They are all social liberals. As, I, you know, as we started talking about Andrew Neil, the great right winger, he's a social liberal. There are no social conservatives at the BBC. Robin wants his job back. <laughs> <laughs> How many albinos do you reckon there are at the BBC? I reckon there's somebody discussing it now <laughs> in a diversity office. We have no albinos. This needs to change. There's, they want that guy from the Da Vinci Code back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> but, but you see this a lot in comedy, and this is one of my bugbears. The majority of people in the referendum voted Brexit. There is only one pro-Brexit comedian on the BBC. It's Jeff Norcott. We love you, Jeff. You're brilliant. There should be other comedians. Yeah, of course. Why is there not any more? Well, um... <laughs> right wingers aren't funny. Um, <laughs> but as we all know, Brexit is not a right wing issue, Constantine. We've had about eighteen hundred episodes. I, I just had to say fact. that because that's what people say, yeah, as if yeah. as if being on different sides of the political spectrum somehow affects how funny you are. Yeah, yeah. no, I, it's, well, it, it's ridiculous. Well, I mean, uh, you know, they. Uh, so why is that? Okay, well, it's a, it's a very interesting question. You know, I've often I, I often wondered why it was that Jeremy Hardy, R.I.P. Bless him. Um, who I didn't find funny at all. I thought he was merely a, a, a propagandist. Um, you could not imagine um, someone, the obverse of Jeremy Hardy on the right, ever being given a platform by the BBC. It just wouldn't happen. When I was way, I mean, so um, this comes down to the idea of what is at work here? is a very pernicious and insidious way of um, patrolling the reservation, right? Within the reservation, certain things are allowed. We're all in the reservation, right? And the reservation is guarded by a liberal elite, which allows certain things to be said. But certain things are not allowed to be said. That's why I've got my, you know, my, my book, the, the Noble Liar, um, the idea behind the title of that book is this, that the BBC is not a malign organization uh, motivated to do us harm. On the contrary, it thinks of itself as being a very good organization motivated by the best of intentions and it wants to do us all good. And that's why it won't allow us to talk about certain things, <laughs> <laughs> which it doesn't feel proper to talk about because they're nasty. So for instance, one might say, that um, the BBC has thrown its protective weight uh, behind the Muslim community in Britain. So anybody who attempts to uh, critique Islam um, is almost instantly labeled as an Islamophobe. And the effect of that is to crush all comment about Islam and to bully those people who have genuine concerns about Islam and, uh, 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 and, and the way that it operates, it's to bully them into silence. 
And that's why you, you don't hear those debates on the BBC. But there are lots of other things they won't talk about. You know, the limitations of feminism. Um, Rob decided to lighten the mood here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with Islam and feminism. Yeah. Well, let, let's keep going. Yeah, look, as soon as you hear said feminism, his Russian ears pricked up. <laughs> yes, we must talk about feminism. <laughs> Excellent. Tell me why women are inferior. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to say that was racist and Francis is getting fired tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Robin. Uh, well, um, you, you know, uh, I think that um, that look, my generation of, of, of men, British men, I was born in the 1950s, and uh, my generation of British men rapidly came to the conclusion that feminism um, was making points which could not be refuted. You know, there is no reason why women shouldn't follow whatever career path they want. There is no reason why when they're in that career, they shouldn't be given exactly the same opportunities as men. However, um, <laughs> I've got so many jokes in my head. I can't, calm, I can't calm, keep calm them down. in. It's okay. Carry on, Robin. We'll, we'll, we'll have to strap him in a bit. He's going to start foaming. Right. <laughs> However, <laughs> an ideology which... Um, which uh, an idea, so, so feminism started as a crusade and it started as a sort of outsider crusade. It's now become mainstream mm. and its beliefs have hardened into an ideology which have the effect of suborning the interests of others. And so you've got the paradoxical effect now that, that males, young males particularly, are beginning, and I have met some young men who feel that the dice are now loaded against them. In fact, feminism has become divisive and it is no recipe for, um, for harmony between the sexes that we have this constant uh, feminist crusade to achieve yet more equality. I mean, I think equality has already, there are of course, you know, pockets of resistance, there always will be. But look, the world isn't fair, and it never will be. You can't just wave the magic wand and make things fair. Of course, you can pass laws which make things fairer, but there will always be instances of unfairness. What we have to strive for is not to empower one particular section of the community, but to look at us all as, you know, we're all human beings, we all deserve respect, we all deserve our own dignity. We deserve to, to fulfill ourselves in the best way we can. Of course, all those things are, are absolutely true. But feminism to me now seems to be um, the, it, it, they're akin to, feminism to me looks like the soldier on the battle, battlefield going down bayoneting the wounded, right? So they vanquish the foe which was male chauvinism, but they can't kick the habit of uh, attacking men and maleness. And actually, uh, for all its apparent strengths and um, you know, that kind of macho stuff, you know, underneath men are just as vulnerable as women by and large. Um, and uh, and uh, I don't think that I don't think that the continuation of the feminist crusade is doing us any favors. It's very well put. Now, we've had several people to talk about it on the show. And uh, we probably, we're not as articulate as you about it when we probably haven't thought about it as carefully as you have. But this is the reason we started trigonometry is that we saw that all these conversations that are crucial to the time that we live in and to the future of our society were not being had in the public media. And that's why we started the show and that's why we're grateful for people like you to come on and, and tell us your views and others that we've had. Uh, we've got time for one last question, Francis. Well, the, the last question is, what is the thing that we're not talking about but we really should be talking about? Right, well, I've given that some thought and I think that what we should be thinking about and we're not thinking about is, and not talking about enough, is um, the place of God in society. So it is my belief 
and it's a, a, a firm belief of mine that that um, a belief in God, from a belief in God, flow the things that a good society needs. We need an objective morality which restrains us all from doing things which, though we want to do them, are not good for us. And what I think is required is the humility. Um, it needs humility. You need humility to recognize and accept the belief uh, that the existence of God. Um, scientism, the belief that science solves all and that science is in some ways a replacement for God, will lead us eventually down terrible blind alley, alleys. Um, we, need to, we need to rediscover our sense of um, our own insignificance and ignorance. We have to understand that we don't understand and we never will understand. There are mysteries beyond human comprehension, I think. And um, the pretense that in some way we do fine without God is a huge mistake. So that's what I think we should talk about. And I think that one of the things which is, which is tearing the country apart at the moment is the lack of any unifying belief system. We've got an elite which believes in nothing beyond what is concrete and human and materialistic. And um, that ignores the experience, the entire experience of humankind from its very beginning. You know, it's striking. You go to, I recently went to Mexico and um, I saw these uh, huge, strange Mayan temples out in the middle of the jungle. And I'd never been before, and I know very little about Mayan culture. But the striking thing is that everywhere you go in the world, as you see the ancient structures, Notre Dame, for instance, you know, all these things are built to the glory of gods, plural. They all, they're all an expression of human belief in God. And actually, I don't think we can do without that. I don't think that, I mean, we think we can do without it. And atheists are very chippy and sort of cocky about it. You know, we're done with all that crap, you know, we don't need that rubbish. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, that's not true. And because in the end, the truth of the matter is uh, that, that God does exist. And he is a reality, or she is a reality, <laughs> <laughs> to billions of people in the world. Um, and that's what a uh, humanist and, uh, and the secular don't really take into account. It's an interesting point because Francis and I are both non-believers. Um, but I hear a lot of what you're saying because I see the effects of our loss of God. And we had Douglas Murray on the show recently, and this is one of the things that he said. He said, look, I'm a non-believer, but I recognize that we need something higher than us uh, in order to keep us and our worst impulses in check. And I also think that whether it's a belief in God or maybe just a, 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 some kind of um, maybe secular, I, I don't know, but there's something that comes with the 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 place where you pray that is a community mm -hmm. something that binds you not only in a broader sense as a society but also binds you to your nearby community that human beings absolutely need and without which we struggle and we wither away and our mental health is affected and i i'm a non-believer but i i see that i i can't ignore that you know it's very it's very interesting that um that I would expect both of you to be non-believers because um, that is uh, how society is, especially you know, young blokes like you, well-educated, very aware of the world. Um, it's actually being, announcing yourself as a believer is actually a, a, a tricky thing to do and it takes a, a bit of courage to do it. But it's strange that 
when you see people, for instance, why do people go to art galleries? Like, you get all these people who flock down to, um, to Tate Modern. Personally, I think it's, a, it's just somewhere you warehouse junk, as far as I can see. But, <laughs> <laughs> but people stand in front. Of, but if you go to a true work of art, uh, a great work of art, you see people standing there. And there is something numinous and beyond them, because they are, they are awed being in the presence of something. They don't know what it is, and I can't put it into words because you can't put this thing into words, but it's a feeling that there is something greater than us, right? And that to me is like a sort of vestigial religious belief. It's the same instinct seeking an explanation for why it is, why things are as they are. You stand in front of something, you think, wow, this is fucking incredible, you know? And it's sort of beyond human in some sort of way. And that um, is, as I say, it, it, it's the, it's the, it springs from the same, the same part of the human experience, the same part of the human consciousness where religion comes from. And it's, it's, it's about um, recognizing and developing that ability in ourselves to see, to see, to, to, to come to grips with and try to understand um, what this thing is. That's where God comes from, actually. And it's, um, it's something which, uh, which is a society I think we, we need to rediscover um, because I think that the, the, the headlong, you know, um, the, the things which we've put in the place of religion, uh, are unsatisfactory. Naked attraction, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> and on that, <laughs> a trash culture. You know. Absolutely. And what, what, what a wonderful way to end the interview. So, uh, Robin, thank you so much. If people want to follow you on Twitter, on social media. Do you use it even? Do you use it? No, no. I didn't think you do. But yeah. do buy Robin's book, The Noble Liar. Uh, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. Uh, and also you write another one as well. Which yeah, is well, about what it, well, that was that was the uh, uh, yes. I mean, no. Get the latest one. All right, get the Nobel Liar. <laughs> Forget the other one. Yeah. Even Robin doesn't want to sell that one. Yeah. Uh, get the Nobel Liar. It's brilliant. Uh, both and Francis and I read it and, and thought there were some really good points, yeah, and they fantastic. enjoyed it. Um, as always, follow us on all the social media. If you're not yet a patron of the show, this is your opportunity. You can get one of these mugs if you give a certain amount. And in general, if you believe in what we're doing and want to support us, uh, please do that. And as always, Francis always says this, and it is really important, every week, every single week, we get notifications of YouTube unsubscribing people from the channel and then you having to resubscribe. If that is happening, keep telling us because we, well, we won't get anything out of them, but at least we can feel late victims. Uh, and you've also forgotten one thing, Constantine. You know what the thing is? Constantine is doing an Edinburgh show. Uh, oh, yes. How can you know, I forget? You need to come on. Yeah. Promote your Edinburgh show. No, you, you, you were doing it. What are you right, doing? Okay, all right. Okay, he's shy. Bless him. He's been in England too long. Go and watch it. It's going to be great. It is on at what time? It's at the 7 Gilded... p.m. at the Gilded yeah, the Balloon, Balloon for the whole of August. It's called All Well That Ends Well. If you go to my Twitter, it's the pinned uh, tweet yeah. there. You can see a little trailer of what the show is going to be about. And I'm doing two shows at the Bill Murray in August, so come along for there. It's called Mixed Race White Bloke, um, I will, and I'll pin something there, so come along and say hello. But guys, thank you so much. Please spread the word, share it, tweet it. We've, we always get tagged, and we see you sharing it, we're sharing what we do, and we're really grateful. So thank you so much. Leave us a nice review on iTunes, and we'll see you next week. See you in Bye-bye. Bye. Now here's the form that you were asked to. <laughs> it said, by signing this contract, this is the UNICEF on campus at SOAS, right? He was asked to sign an agreement that his routine would not contain racism, sexism, classism, ageism, ableism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-religion, anti-atheism. I think you're doing some quite complicated mental arithmetic to offset the fact that people didn't think you were funny. Uh, I think the reality well, is... Well, the, the, when you these students okay, saw me performing a top secret comedy club. You have absolutely no sense of humour, do you? I feel like you're just... I mean, you're just sort of being a bit of an alt-right. 
you know. Oh, all right. Well, that, that, we got there in the end. You did. You did. You did. Oh, that, that, I, I, very I, good. I, the good thing about being called an arty comedian, right, is I now have got a niche. <laughs> Problem is, I haven't got any racist, sexist, homophobic jokes. They don't do them in the student at the university. Well, you can't make any joke about anything in case these poor little woke students get upset or triggered. Get over yourselves. It's not about comedy, it's about ordinary people up and down the country and here in Britain yes. and in America feeling like they can't say what they think. I really don't, like, I get it, I get it, especially, especially the women who want to become men. I get it. <laughs> Do you remember when Gareth Bale, right, went from Tottenham to Real Madrid? The guy left a perfectly good club for more money. <laughs> Everybody feels like we are, we're all kind of under arrest. We are all, all, everything we say can and will be used against us in the court of public opinion. And they're coming for the comedians first because we're, we're the ones that, as you say, are allowed to transgress. But everybody else feels it and that's why the story's got the resonance that it has.